טוב, שלום עליכם. We continue in משנה תורה. רבנו הגדול, רבנו משה בן מימון, זכרו לברכה. הלכות עבודה זרה וחוקות הגויים, פרק ד', הלכה יר ד', או ט', שיירה העוברת ממקום למקום. השיירה is a caravan. In other words, a, uh, a party of people it might be merchants, and it might be uh, people simply traveling from place to place. And uh, the, the reasonable and, and uh, practical way of doing so was to travel as part of a, a party of people. And this such a party, such a collection of people was called a Shi'ara. This was uh, a, a day-to-day reality. Um, <clears throat> Rambam discusses uh, in the Teshuvah uh, how long it takes to travel from uh, Mithraim to, to Yerushalayim by, by, by such means. The Radbaz, if I'm not mistaken, the Rambam mentions 10 days. The Radbaz in a Teshuvah says seven days, apparently different routes or something like that. Uh, but there were, even in, in desert areas, there were accepted and uh, well-traveled routes through through uh, even desolate areas. So a Shayara that was traveling from A to B, now, if they happened, that, that, that these such caravans, such parties that were traveling from place to place, uh, especially if it's a longer journey, they had to have stops. They had to have, uh, again, these were well-known, well-marked out and, fre- and frequented places that all such shayaroth stopped at for the night. We also know this from uh, Arab Nabataean uh, traders who had a, a very, very lengthy uh, trade route, which was covered by uh, by camels, mainly uh, from from Teman, from Shiva, all the way up the Arabian Peninsula into uh, what is today called uh, Jordan, uh, and then and then towards uh, the coast at Aza. This was a very long journey, but it was a very lucrative trade. Uh, and this is uh, how the Nabataeans, for example, and well before them, uh, many other. Uh, desert tribes uh, made uh, a living and they they had uh, there were well known stops in the desert along the way and such a stop was known as a han which is not dif- not very difficult different from the word hanaya in modern hebrew right a parking place place to park to stop these places were called a han and some of them were actually uh, fairly permanent uh, structures and, and encampments with stone buildings, or at least one central stone building. And uh, in fact, not long ago, I, I visited such a place in the Negev. So such a shayara is traveling from place to place. If one of the stops, shall we say, it stopped in, in Iran, in other words, a town where Jews, uh, the majority of the people, uh, decided together to worship Abu Dazara, as we've discussed in this and previous Purakim chapters. And they themselves participated in this uh, terrible event. Im shahat sham shadoshim yom, nerarim basayif. Then, if they stay, if they happen to uh, Camp there for for thirty days. They, then they are killed like the others, <clears throat> the other people of that town. And they are by the sword, 
Umamunam Aved, and their property is forfeit. Right. But if not, they're not, in other words, 30 days is the minimum in order to be considered a member of a of a place. This is also true when it comes to uh, What After how many days living in a place, you become hayav to uh, participate in the local charity fund. And for other, other considerations, Shadoshim uh, Yom is the is the cutoff point. So if they, they were there less than 30 days, then they are considered like any other person who is Abadabudazara, and therefore Mithatham Bispila, they are to be put to death by stoning. And but then their property belongs to the, those who by law inherit them. Irani Dahad, as we've discussed, is a is a special legal category. And, and different rules apply. So a person who is uh, who transgressed something in the Torah, even something very serious, and is executed for that reason, that person's property is is not forfeit. It belongs belongs to his children or whoever by by Allah according to Allah inherits from that person. So that's that's the, the upshot of this halakha. And this, of course, has to do with the fact that, uh, that the Torah, when discussing this halakha, this concept of irani dahat, re- refers to uh, yoshave ha'ir. So to be considered yoshave ha'ir, they have to live there for 30 days. If you happen to ask the question, well, since when does a traveling caravan stay put for 30 days, the answer is that it might do so for various reasons. It might be, for example, uh, let's say there is a uh, uh, well-known affair, a market, uh, a a place and time where different traders from different directions come at a certain time to offer their wares. So these people may, may arrive before this and uh, stay for a while and set up shop, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, prepare for this big, this big event, commercially speaking, and they may stay some time after that. Again, for business reasons, that might be one reason. There, and there might be other reasons as well. It might be that uh, such a caravan is known to travel from A to, to Z via all kinds of stops along the way. So it goes from A to B and from B to C, etc. And other people or, tra- or traders who wish to join that caravan know that on a certain day, if they want to join that caravan, they have to arrive because they're leaving from a certain spot on a certain day. That, that's known in advance. And we know about we know about such things. We have uh, um, do- documents and other indications of this. Okay. Nixe and Sheha Irhalacha Yod or Tetwell. Nixe and She Medina Ahareth. Shayu Mufkadim Bethucha. The property of people from a different town. The word Medina he means a town, a walled city. Shayu Mufkadim Bethucha. That were. Being kept and being, uh, they were deposited in a perhaps a kind of bank arrangement or something like that, where traders could deposit uh, funds or, or 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 merchandise and and pick them up later or things of this nature. Even though the, the people of the Irani Dahat who uh, are in charge of this pro- who accepted this property to be, to be in charge of it, and even though they are legally responsible for this property, any srafim, nevertheless, the, this this property which is not theirs, they are looking after it, and maybe they're even being paid to look after it, but it's not their property. Any srafim, these things are not uh, set to the torch. As as the rest of the city is, these things 
will uh, must be returned to their owners. Shneimar shalalah ulo shalal averta. So the all the property of 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 that town that belongs to it goes goes up in flames with it, but not anything else. Nichzeh haroshaim shehu dahu shayu mufkadim. The property of of the Ehud doers of an Irani Daha, Shehud Dahu, and they're guilty of having been part of such an act. Shehumuf Kadim bim Dina Herat, but they happen that certain parts of their property happen to be elsewhere at this point point in time, not in, the, in this particular town, not in the Irani Dahat. If <coughs> if the things happen to have been uh, brought before the Beddin passes judgment and were, were returned to the Irani Dahat, they are uh, Condemned to the flames with everything else. We imlo en ma abdi mothan ella yinathanul yaloshehen. But if not, uh, this property again belongs to the those who inherit according to halacha. Behema an animal hasya shalayir hanidah wa hasya shalayir harith. An animal, let's say a horse, for example, uh, which happens to belong uh, to a person or to the town itself, half, but only half of it is owned by one, by one person, shall we say, in this town, and the other half, they're, they're, they are partners. They hire out this horse, shall we say, for various purposes. And the other half belongs to another person, <clears throat> which has which has nothing to a person who has nothing to do with this event. Arezo <clears throat> asura. In other words, and, th and therefore this bema is asura. In other words, it's considered part of the inner dahat because you cannot divide. Uh, a living being, yeah, as it were, into to separate cells. It's an organism, and each each part uh, is interconnected with, and each part uh, feeds the other part. So it's, it's all one one uh, entity. <clears throat> As opposed to what? As opposed to, for example, Isa. Where Isa she can, if there is a doe, a doe, uh, let's say uh, there is a baker in this town, and the next door town is not the baker, and they work together. And uh, sometimes one of them produces a large doe, and then uh, divides it in half, and, and gives the, the half of that doe to his, uh, to his, um, Business partner, the other baker, in the, in the might might be in a, a village next to the town or something like that. <clears throat> in modern terms, you might think in terms of the city center, and there might be an outlying suburb or something in two different areas. So an isa is something that you can divide because they're not uh, organically connected in that sense. You can always you can take any dough and divide into as many pieces as you wish, and you have as many doughs. The small, smaller does as you wish. It's you, you cannot do the same with a horse, for example. You can't uh, divide a horse in two, and uh, each partner benefits from half of the horse. It doesn't. That doesn't work. Where Isa shehike and Uteraf lefisha shala halok ha Isa. Behemash shela irani dahat shenish hatra asura behana. <laughs> Any behemoth that belonged to the Irani Dahat, 
to one or more people in the Ir Hanidahar that was uh, slaughtered before uh, before the place was set to the torch. That uh, is Asura This is of course after the Beddin. Once the Beddin has passed judgment, and then it was slaughtered before it could be destroyed by fire. It is Asura Bahana'a Keshor Haniskal. Keshor Haniskal refers to, uh, shall we say, an ox that gored and killed uh, an, a human being. Uh, this is also true of uh, of an animal that uh, was part of some uh, some perverse sexual uh, interaction between a human being and this animal. She mishash the 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 halacha is that the <clears throat> beima shorhani, which is called the shorhani skal because the animal itself is also a stone to death, uh, is a surah cannot be benefited from in any way once the, the deen has been passed. We continue. Alakha yod zayn or yod beth, sa'ar harush. Ben shel anoshim, ben shel anoshim shabah. Hair that was uh, cut uh, from 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 the heads of people in this Irani dahat, whether of men or of women. The the hair itself is mutar bahana. It can be used uh, for various purposes, such as. Uh, Producing a wig or, or all kinds of or various purposes, uh, hair can be used as a stuffing for pillows and what have you. <clears throat> so hair itself is mutar bahana. Aval shel peano chrith, harehi michlal shelala u asur. In other words, hair by itself is is not considered. Property, but a peanochrith, which usually would be translated as a wig, but uh, I will explain them in a moment, uh, perhaps a more precise explanation of what a peanochrith is. Uh, that is really an item, that is a uh, an item which is sold, bought and sold, and uh, it has its own uh, legal standing as an as a item of property. So therefore, a pe'an nukhrith, harehi mikhlav shalala, it is part of the property of that town, wa'asur, and must be destroyed. The term pe'an nukhrith uh, is mentioned also in Masech Shabbat. And as the, uh, I think it's the Me'iri, the Benam al Me'iri, then the Gra certainly explains it this way, uh, over there in the Mishnah. A peanochrith is not what we would call simply a, a wig nowadays, and the, and the, and this therefore the salakhat is in no way any any kind of uh, proof that it is mutar for a married woman woman to cover her hair with a with a wig, not at all. A peanochrith, first of all, the word itself pea literally means a corner or a piece, like a pea v'sade is the corner. Or the the end, the edge of the field, that which is left when you harvest an entire field, shall we say, of wheat, you have to leave a pea. That is a small, small section at the end. So a pea is always part of something greater, something larger. It's not something that stands alone. <clears throat> and here too, a pea, nukhrith, that is to say, uh, it's a hairpiece, what we would call today perhaps a hairpiece. Uh, who, who, and for what purpose would a woman wear such a thing? Let's say for some medical reason, her, her hair fall, her fell out, so she's bald. 
or her hair is extremely uh, extremely thin. Now she covers her hair like all other women, but <clears throat> she places a pe'an or some kind of hairpiece uh, at some point under the covering so, so that a small amount sticks out, which is the norm for all women. The claim that not one single hair should be seen, or it may be seen when a woman has to cover her hair, is not is not true. That's not uh, what what we find in the Mishnah, as we see here, or in this halacha here, or in the Talmud, and that's not what the Rashba writes in the Teshuvah, where he says explicitly that the the hair that is normally visible outside the covering of woman's hair is not considered erwa. So that which it says in the Talmud in Barachoth. Uh, does not include that. The, that. This idea that not one hair must be seen is, is uh, to be found in the Zahar only. And uh, it is a most unfortunate statement because it leads uh, certain people to claim incorrectly that the only possible legitimate way to cover a woman for a woman to cover her hair is to wear a wig because only then can you cover all of the hair. Uh, so the, these are very, uh, these are entirely spurious ideas. A pe'an nukhrit is a kind, same kind of hair piece which a woman, uh, she hasn't got her own hair, she, she gets the hair of another woman and uh, places it on some kind of a pad or basis, or I'm not sure, some kind of netting and glues it on or what have you, or sews it on. And it can be placed on the head under the cover and so that a little bit sticks out so she doesn't look bald. Because for a woman to look bald, to, to be seen to be bald, is a ganai, is not uh, not considered uh, desirable at all, quite the opposite. Because it's not uh, it's it's uh, it's not the norm, not the normal way of the world. And that's what a peanochrith is. <clears throat> so a peanochrith, the halacha is, is a separate uh, piece of property it has a it's it's something that's bought and sold by name not by weight but by its name and therefore it's a sur and therefore it's a sur peroth de kalim shibethacha mutarim shenema tikboth wasarafta misha eno mohusar ela kibuth in other words Things that all manner of property, including uh, food, for example, uh, which which is which is ready to be sold or to be eaten as is, shall we say, dates that have been uh, harvested from from the palms, from the date palms, and all all you need to do now is to sell it in the shulk, in the market, or or eat it. You don't have to do anything such as harvest it. So that's that's perof de kalim shibetoha. That's what we're referring to. In other words, something which is still connected to the tree. Misha enom husa el Things which only need to be piled together and set alight. Those things have to be destroyed. Yasu perof ha mahubarim. Those fruit, types of fruit, or those a kind of produce. Shehem muhusarim talisha wa kibus usrefa. Those anything that needs still some manner of harvesting or agricultural process in order to make it available for human consumption, that is not something which only needs to be piled up on the on the uh, fire and and set satellite, and that is therefore mutar. And the same is true of hair, as we said before. And the same is true of the trees themselves. The trees which are mahubarim lakarka, which are uh, connected to the earth, uh, are not considered property and may be uh, used and may be inherited. Halakha Yodhif. 
keep in mind again this the, the, these are all uh, details which re refer to how this halakha is implemented halakha ma'ase which is a, as we've said before very harsh extreme and uh, unique reality in the Torah that, that an entire town essentially is destroyed because of uh, Abu Dazara that was uh, tolerated and, and uh, acted upon by a majority of the people in this in this town such a such a place becomes a a blight on on the uh, on the face of the Jewish people and a source of a uh, future likely a, a source of future trouble of similar events and it, it is something that has to be uh, unequivocally annulled and destroyed so that it cannot cannot serve as such a uh, a focus of of evil in the future. And yes, there are other types of realities that we could imagine uh, that should be viewed in a similar vein. As with many things in the Torah, the Torah spells out a the, the principle of, of of something, and we are to extrapolate from it to various other analogous situations. This is true of many many things in the Torah, and it's true here as well. In other words, things that were dedicated to the Mikdash, shall we say, uh, animals. There was a cow, shall we say, or a sheep, and it was dedicated to the Mikdash by someone in that town. And keep in mind, you may you may ask, how, why would a person do that if they believe in Abu Dazara? Well, as you as we saw, for example, first of all, there are always these kinds of people who uh, who wish to cover all their bets. So they worship this and they worship that, and they believe in this and they believe in something else. As Eliyahu Hanavi says to Am Yisrael, Admatayatim posahim arshne haseipim. Till, till, till when will you continue to uh, to try and, uh, as the expression is in Hebrew, to dance at both weddings? That doesn't work. That, that cannot be allowed. So that might be one reason. Another reason, uh, you may have a behemoth hegdesh in, in an irani daha, is uh, you have tzadikim also, you have good people in this town perhaps, who um, their, and their property is also forfeit, as we've seen before in this parak. So even though they themselves are, are not to be harmed, but their property is is forfeit. And the, everything in the town goes up in flames. So Ahikdeshoth, those things that uh, were dedicated to the Vigdash, Kodshem is Yamuthu. Uh, anything, any behima which was mukdash to the music, uh, to the mukdash, um, so we're talking about animals that may be sacrificed. Yamuthu, they sh they they are to die. Why? Zebah rushaim toiva says the pasuk in Mishlei. In other words, the an animal dedicated and coming uh, emanating from such a source. Is considered a ta'iva, is something unseemly and impossible to accept, and it cannot be brought to the Mizbeah. In other words, if a person took an animal and said, 
This behema I am uh, making to Hekdesh for the purpose of offering it as a as a as a as a zebah, as a sacrifice in the mikdash. That behema is to be put to death. An animal that was dedicated for its monetary value. So let's say, let's say for argument's sake, it's worth ten thousand shekel. So. So the person really did not dedicate the animal, but its value to the mikdash. So that can be redeemed. In other words, the, the money has to be paid but uh, and transferred to another item. But the animal itself can be uh, is to be destroyed. Those that were redeemed, were, in other words, the, the, the monetary value was transferred to another animal. But this animal is to be destroyed. So it says shalala, velo shalal shamay. It talks about the shalal of the ear of the town, the property of the town, not of the mikdash, not that which belongs to to la gavua to Hashem. And that is why they have to be redeemed, because as long as they have not been redeemed, they are still considered nixesh shamayim. They belong to the Mikdash, they belong to Hashem. They have to be redeemed. The Kudush has to be transferred, like with Ma'asel Sheni, to another object. And then the original can, is no longer Kadosh, and can now is no longer Kutresh shamayim. It's no longer called Shalal shamayim, and now it can be destroyed. Again, the, the, all, all these Hoth indicate clearly how how seriously um, and how how uh, the, the the enormity of of the uh, of the reality of the irhani dahat is is such a incomprehensible and totally unacceptable reality that 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 uh, the destruction of such a thing is total, it must be total. In other words, there are things <laughs> regarding which there, there is no room for leniency and, and no, no, uh, no room for compromise. And that, that too applies to various things in the Torah, not only to this very specific example. <laughs> so an animal which is a bechor and therefore is is kadosh, is kadosh has a kedushat bechora, and it is the, to be brought as a as a korban, and uh, only the kohanim may eat from it. That's a bechor. And maaser, we're talking about maasal behema, which is. Uh, 10% ma'asir of behemoth tahorot, animals which are uh, tahor and may be brought as, as a as a korban every year. That's ma'asar uh, is it belongs to the owner, but it has to be brought as a korban, like ma'asir sheni in, in Yerushalayim, etc., etc. So the Torah provides for a number of of situations and eventualities where a person is required to come to Yerushalayim with his property and and uh, spend time in Yerushalayim, spend time near the Mikdash, where he will also be surrounded by uh, Torah and uh, other things which are perhaps not available where he lives most of the time. So these, these are all... Uh, Opportunities for uh, charging one's and one's family's spiritual batteries, for example, and that is how these things should be understood. So, if they are tamim, they may be brought as a, as a uh, without blemish. They are they are to, they are considered like kodeshemiz as we said before. So that that you not, cannot bring a korban. From that which is uh, considered uh, toiva, and it has to be destroyed. Uva'alem those that are uh, 
that those that may be uh, that that have blemish and therefore cannot be a korban anyhow harehim bichlal behemta when they are they are also uh, they they also die because they they are considered um, and they're put to death by the sword <clears throat> they are to be uh, the difference between Yomuthu is that they can die, they put aside and die by themselves at some point. But Nerahim means that they're, they're killed by, by the sword. In other words, Turuma, the tithe which is given to the Kohanim. Which is Kodash, which can only be consumed by a Kohen or his family. If they uh, if they had already been given into the hands of a Kohen, they must be allowed to rot. But they're not burnt uh, directly. We do not actively destroy it because they they have kedusha. So to destroy. Terumah tehora is a sword. Terumah tamea, terumah which may not be consumed by a kohen because it's tame, uh, is to be burnt anyhow because it cannot be consumed by anybody else. Terumah tehora cannot be set alight deliberately, but it can be allowed to rot. Yirkuvu mipneshehem nechasal because they belong to the to to the kohen. It's part of the of the. Uh, it belongs to the Kohen. So it's not considered part of the uh, shalal of the ear. We in him be Israel, but if it is still in the hands and in the possession of the Israel who who is required to hand it over to the Kohen, then it should be given to a Kohen from another town. And they cannot they cannot be redeemed. It's not like Ma'asir Shani. And it's not like uh Bedekabai that we discussed earlier, where there is no Kiddushatha Guf, there's Kiddushat Mamon, but not Kiddushatha Guf. So the Kiddusha of the Mamon can be transferred from one item to another item. So if a person has produce, which is Ma'asir Shani, which is difficult to bring to Yerushalayim, it may uh, rot on the way or what have you. Then he's po there, he transfers the kiddushah to, to, onto coins, brings that money to Yerushalayim, there purchases uh, other produce for himself and his family to consume in Yerushalayim. And the kiddushah is transferable from one item to another item. That's because there is no kiddushah haguf. Where you have Kiddushat HaGuf, but the thing itself is Kadosh, and it cannot be Nifde. It cannot be uh, considered as, as a, 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 an, as a unit of value, but rather as a, a unit of Kiddushat in itself. So Turumai has a different status, and therefore is not uh, redeemable. What do you do with all these various items that you find in Iran Yidahav? They are to be buried or, or uh, hidden away, not to be used, as we said before, like with the Hekdesh. We said, Zebah Rushaim Toiva. The same is true even of a Sefer Torah that you find in such a town. It will always be known as the Sefer Torah of the Irani Dahat, and that is a Ta'iva. And therefore, but you can't destroy a Sefer Torah. So what do you do? You put it into a Geniza. It's not to be used, it's to be put away, buried, uh, hidden, stored away someplace where it cannot be reached. Uh, and that's it, left alone. And the same is true with Ma'asir Shini, uh, items which Food produce, which is ma'asir sheni, or kesef ma'asir sheni, that too is to be uh, essentially 
it is forfeit and it is uh, made to disappear as it were. Now, all of these things, of course, as we've said before, uh, this entire concept of inner dahal is a very extreme and uh, one would imagine rather rare occurrence. And therefore, uh, it was also, and people also see it as something very, very uh, extreme. So Hazal made the, the following statement: "Kol din dahav." He who carries out all these halachot, all these requirements, with regards to a place that is that has uh, been clearly identified. And by a duth, by witnesses, etc., to be an irahi dahat, harezek and akriv ola kalil. Such a person is doing a very good thing. It is as if this person, all the people involved in this act of destruction, the Khura, it's an act of a terrible act of destruction, and it is. And it is precisely for that reason that it is done to be uh, to shock and and uh, cause awe and uh, and uh, astonishment in the eyes of all who, who see it and who, all those who hear of it. Because it is a statement, a very harsh, and but ne nevertheless very necessary statement of how serious and how impossible and unacceptable uh, th this reality is. And he who uh, executes this this uh, judgment or the Beit Din in practice, and the Beit Din itself, they are as if they bringing an Ola Kali. In other words, they're bringing a, like why an Ola? Because an Ola is a is a korban that is entirely consumed by fire on the Mizbeah, and this is also something which is consumed by fire. Harazek and Makariv Ola Kalil. Kalil means altogether destroyed by fire. Shanema Kalil Ladunai Lahacham. Wulaud, and that's what it says with, with regards to Irani Dahat, that it is destroyed completely. Wulaud Ela Shem Misalek Haron Af Misrael. And by so doing, uh, they, the, the, the people who are responsible for making these decisions and implementing them, are, are saving Am Yisrael from terrible Haron Af. From divine uh, anger and justice. So you see, the Pesukim all explicitly make these statements that such a reality of an Irani Dahat, the place which serves as a, uh, a base and a, a center of anti Torah agitation and ideas and philosophy and practices. Such a place results in haron af from from Hashem from above, and and is to be destroyed. And by destroying it, we remove the reason for that haron af, for that anger. And 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 rather than It, it it brings barakha and rahamim blessing and and mercy from above to Israel. Shenema wa nathan alakha rahamim brihamkha wa hilbakha. Perhaps we'll look at these psukim for a moment. <clears throat> Let us read the Pesukim again to remind ourselves what the Torah actually says explicitly regarding uh, this concept of an Irani Dahath, which we are now uh, more or less uh, we've completed this Perak at least. Kiti Shma, it says here, and this is, this is in Perak Yud Gimel of Sefer Devarim, Pasuk Yud Gimel. Kiti Shma, Bahath Arecha, Asher Adonai Elohecha, Nuthen Lecha. 
when you hear about a certain place uh, in your land that Hashem has given you, you hear the following. Yasu anoshim benevelia mikilbacha. Certain people amongst you have done the following. We are dihu at Yoshavairam Remol, and they have incited the, the uh, people of their town. Nelecha wuna abda Elohim Aharima Shaloyadata. Let us worship uh, foreign gods. Which of course includes and implies the act of various acts of worship as we discussed uh, previously in these halachot, uh, but also uh, implies, of course, accepting uh, all manner of foreign ideologies and uh, philosophies and practices, even if they are not specifically related to uh, worshipping Abu Dazara in the classic sense, because these things always go together. And you must investigate thoroughly. And you discover that this is true. And this, in fact, this this abominable thing took place in your midst. You are to put to the sword all the inhabitants of that town. With kola shelba, with behemta lefi harim. And everything is to be killed. Everything that can be killed by the sword is to be killed by the sword, which is what we just saw a moment ago about uh, animals that were ba'le mumin, and therefore uh, they, they, they're hekdesh or they're kadosh, they have uh, kedusha, such as a bechor, but they cannot be brought as a bechor, as a korban. So then we said they, yamuthu, they must be allowed simply to die, so they're put aside. And they and they then they die of their own uh, without without intervention from anyone else, or if they are connected, if they, if they are bale mumin, we said they are neharorim. So hakeh hakeh means to kill by the sword. At yoshevei ha'ira hila fi harim, acharem utha with kol asher ba, with behem tola fi harim. All of it must be destroyed by the sword. With kol shalala. All the property is to be gathered together into the town square. All of it is to be put to the torch. It is to remain a site of desolation and destruction. To bear witness to this abominable occurrence and to what happens to such a place. So it is a, a, a not a living reminder, but a, a dead and destroyed reminder, and a, um, kind, a kind of a place of, of memorial, so that people will never forget such a thing. And nothing must, you must not take anything from his property. Because this, such a reality, Nam Yisrael brings tremendous haron af, divine anger against Nam Yisrael. And you may think, and some people will claim, that uh, doing such terrible things, destroying and being so cruel and destructive, will will harm you spiritually. That is not true. Doing the right thing for the right reason, even if it involves destruction or killing, uh, does not and should not impact a person negatively, but rather the opposite. The, as it says here, mm-hmm. it causes them to be uh, blessed and to be uh, re- looked upon with mercy by Hashem. Why? Why? Because when you do the right thing, that which is commanded by Hashem, you're doing the ashar, the asot ha-yashar you're doing that which is true and correct and proper and necessary. 
And if something is true and correct and proper and necessary, then you cannot go wrong, no matter what, what it is that you're required to do. And the very same thing can and must be said with regards to certain other miswot in the Torah, such as, uh, in general, destroying evil in the world. A, a specific example, of course, is Mihiyat Amalek. And now we have, as we have discussed, Amalek does not refer to a specific uh, gene pool of people in the world necessarily, but any any uh, known, definable uh, tribe, nation, group of people who are sworn enemies of the Jewish people and therefore of the, of the Torah by definition. And this is increasingly clear, should be clear nowadays to everybody uh, who occasionally hears some news that uh, it's all about anti-Semitism. In other words, All those people, uh, including you may have heard, uh, as I did yesterday, about the, uh, the extremely evil individual from the uh, famous rock band Pink Floyd, whose name is Roger Waters, Shem Roshaim Yerkov. You may have heard what he said yesterday or the day before. One cannot... Uh, one cannot but uh, understand and conclude that, uh, despite his protestations that he's not anti-Semitic but only anti-Zionist, that there is no such thing as being anti-Zionist and not being anti-Semitic. And uh, these are one and the same thing and always have been, always have been, and always will be. And, and therefore... All, all manner of people, as we were saying, Amalek, for example, but all, all manner of uh, sworn enemies of the Jewish people are, are evildoers by definition. And destroying evildoers is not an unfortunate or negative thing. It is a positive and necessary thing. As, uh, as we, next time, Bezat Hashem, what we will do, we will look uh, briefly at what Rambam writes in Moran Abuchim, on, on these matters. I want to uh, show something else to you briefly before we end for today. With regards to uh, one, one of the aspects of these halakhot that we've been discussing is, of course, the concept of the masith, the inciter, he who causes others to, to do the opposite of Hashem's will in the world. So Rambam writes here in Yilchot, this is in Yilchot uh, Sanhedrin, Perakud Aleph, Yilchot Sanhedrin, um, you can see the, the, the full name of these halachot is Hilchot Sanhedrin wa Ha'onashim Ha'masurim Lahem. So the Sanhedrin is not just a, a place, a Bet Midrash, where people gather to, to study Torah. It is also a place where people implement the Torah, enact the Torah in all its aspects, including the most unsavory uh, and, and uh, unfortunate Realities, in other words, where it is necessary to punish and, and in, in some cases, as we see here, to destroy without mercy. Rambam writes this over here in Yilchot Sanhedrin Perak Yud Aleph, Halacha Zayin, or Hey, Rambam says, Hea Masith, En Dino Keshar Dino Nefashot. The Masith, a person who incites and leads others astray, other Jews astray. For that matter, I think it also can apply and should apply to uh, not just the people who, send, uh, who lead. Jews astray, but even non-Jews astray. B'nai Noach are human beings. They are required to be uh, moral beings and live according to a certain code. And a person who 
leads them astray and uh, encourages them not to do so is uh, Masith also and is destroying the world by so doing. So Rambam says, He's not just like any other person who's hayav, possibly hayav mita, if he's found guilty. Rather, what we do here, we are, we are allowed to uh, entrap him, as it were. In other words, we know that he's likely to do such a thing. We set up a dim, witnesses to, you know, you know, hidden behind a curtain or a wall or whatever it might be. And, and so they will hear and see what he's doing without him being aware of this. This is something we do not do with any other kind of capital crime. So we, we hide witnesses in order to be able to uh, testify against him and execute him later. And this is the only case where he's not uh, the person is not required to be warned in advance that what you're doing is a sword and, and you are likely to be to be found guilty and put to death for this. You're not required to do so in the case of a Masih. Because we're discussing an ideological battle with evil. We're not discussing uh, individual yasrim, uh, passions or uh, appetites or, or, or other various reasons why people commit actions which are asura according to the Torah. Here we're talking about an ideological war against the Torah against the truth, against Hashem. If such a person was found not to be guilty, and he, the, the, the Bed Din heard all the evidence and said, well, he, we can't convict him. He's, he's Zakai. We have to let him go. And they let him go, even though they're not, they can't be certain that he's innocent, but they also cannot be certain that he's guilty. So he has to be allowed to go. But if someone then arrives and says all of a sudden, after the Bedin decides that he's Zakai, no, no, I have evidence, I can prove that he's guilty, we bring him back and we hear the evidence, which we do not do in other cases. Once a person was found guilty, he's free to go. Even if someone else arrives afterwards and says, no, no, I have something else to add, it's too late. If he's then found guilty, and someone else shows up now and says, but I have proof that he's not guilty. I can I can undo this uh, this psak din. I can cause it to be revoked. And Mahzali he's the, the the person is not brought back to be found uh, innocent. In other words, if we know that he's a that he is a masif, and we we were presented with evidence to that effect, we go, we do not in any way try and, and protect him from the from the law, which is the case, and the punishment, which is the case with other. Capital crimes, not with a masith. When to anim la masith, we do not find reasons to to prove his innocence. Such people are normally not to be in a beth din that, that might condemn a person to death because they are likely to be lacking in 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 mercy, lacking in uh, compassion. So someone misha en banim, for example. So he has less compassion for another, another human being. Or a zaken who's very old and uh, has forgotten what it is to be a father or to have children or to... He's, he's more removed from uh, most people nowadays in his current state. Because we, we, we do not want people who will find reason to be merciful. Being harsh and implementing the law to its fullest extent with regards to people who lead people astray from the truth to, to that which is heaven, which is nothingness, emptiness, and uh, vanity, and evil. This is in fact an act of, of compassion to the world. Yes, to this individual who's an, an evildoer, it's it's it is um, cruel and harsh and without compassion. But to the rest of the world, it is an act of compassion. Hashem will give you rahamim and will make you a ba'al rahamim. Because only a person who knows, and this is something we see in the world as well, 
only a person who knows that with regards to certain things, there is no room for rahami. There is no, it is not possible to be compassionate towards certain kinds of evil. Only such people can truly be uh, rahamanim to those who require rahamim. Kolam rahim ala achzarim, sofo mitachzer ala rahmanim. And we see this today, right now in Israel, today we see this. <clears throat> uh, various legal uh, authorities in the country today, who of course are all uh, people who, who represent the opposite of the Torah in every respect. This is exactly what, the, we see this today very clearly. Yesterday, the day before, electricity was reconnected in Gaza City. By Israel, of course. Wonderful idea. Uh, there's more food today in Aza, in Aza than there was before the war. This is by some, based on some international uh, account, which appeared in the Daily Telegraph, uh, amongst other places, for example. Um, <clears throat> these same authorities have uh, busied themselves for many months now ensuring that the the Amalekim who who perpetrated the atrocities on Shmini Asereth on the 7th of October uh, will not be tried by military court, will not could not be executed, etc. So they're being considered like bank robbers, like uh, common criminals, etc. They're being protected by by these evildoers, these uh, so-called uh, people of, of law and, and morality, they are being protected by them. Why? Precisely for this reason. Because when mercy and compassion is without limit, and you cannot see evil for what it is, and you are unwilling to deal with evil as it must be dealt with, then the only, and it's precisely in this, in this kind of uh, situation or this is an example of, of of what Chazal said as we said a moment ago because there are always these two sides to the coin in reality there is there's no such thing as a one-sided coin and if you do not recognize the two sides and act appropriately in each situation then you are simply destroying the world you're not being compassionate, you're destroying the world. And, uh, and therefore such people, such legal authorities, uh, such, uh, such uh, beacons of morality as they like to see themselves are, are in fact the very opposite. They are the propagators of, of, of evil and, and cruelty in the world. And that, and, that, and that is why when it comes to a masith, as we see in this halakha in Yichot, uh, uh, Sanhedrin, there is no room for mercy, quite the opposite. Uh, we do not uh, seek to be merciful. We, we seek to do that which is required and necessary. Rabbi? Yes. Mm -hmm. While we're on the subject, has anything changed in Noah Daniel? Regards to who's allowed to enter. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I can't hear very well. I, I was asking if anything had changed in Noah Daniel about the subject who's allowed to enter and who isn't allowed to enter. Certain who used to work in, in Noah Daniel uh, have, been, uh, have been fired, they were paid. Uh, I happen to know they were paid uh, compensation when they were fired, and they no longer work here. Uh, certain exceptions have been made for certain reasons. Uh, it's still a it's still a bit of contention, and I believe that the matter will be um, will come to a head in the coming weeks and months. I think there's going to be some kind of big. Uh, um, some some. Uh, gathering of uh, residents and a vote or something like that, I think, I believe. I know for a fact that uh, quite a number of other Yishuvim that I've been made aware of have have voted to uh, not allow uh, Amalekim in, into their towns. But does that apply to everywhere? 
I'm sure it does not. And uh, there are many people who uh, whose views on these matters are are based on uh, on on nothing but uh, a lack of moral clarity, as we see here. This is all about moral clarity. This this, this concept of yirani dahat and all these halachot that we've discussed is about moral clarity, and that is what uh, Christianity, by definition, and that anything which devolves from Christianity, which is the Western world as we know it today, which as not, as post-Christian as it might be, uh, it is nevertheless at root extremely Christian. In other words, various Christians, ide Christian ideas on the basis of, of Western liberal thinking. To this day, even if the churches are empty in many places, um, That that view of the world leads to destruction, can only lead to 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 destruction, to immorality, to cruelty, quite the opposite of what they would like to claim that they are uh, aiming for. It is only by being able to look evil in the eye and deal with it uh, ruthlessly, as the Torah, as we see, as the Torah requires, that we can actually do. Uh, bring about uh, an improvement in the in the state of of the world and of humanity. And this is again why this is one of the reasons why we have other, various other concepts in the Torah, as we have mentioned, whether it is hayat um, abalek or or in general or fighting the enemy and how one fights the enemy. Um, and this this. Con concept of Irani Dahat is uh, another example, an extreme example. But there are, of course, other, uh, many other things which are perhaps less extreme, less total, but uh, nevertheless very, very telling. And any, uh, there are many other forms of, of capital crime that can be punished by, by, uh, by Beth Din sentencing someone to be put to death, for example. Uh, the most obvious and simple example is, is murder. And the idea that it is somehow more moral not to execute a murderer than it is to execute him is a, is a classic, is the is the uh, is a classic example of, of Christian thought. The opposite of of the Torah. It's interesting to note that in few countries nowadays, the United States is a, a, an exception. Many of most of the states, I believe, or many of the states in the United States, uh, are an exception to this rule. There, there is still uh, the, a reality of executing people for certain crimes, such as murder. It may not be uh, implemented uh, in all cases, and in many cases, they may find ways of of not doing so or delaying doing so. But uh, the concept still exists, which which uh, is, is interesting, which proves that there is a certain, uh, somehow some trace elements of, of uh, Torah truth, which, which filtered their way through into the, uh, Amer the, the American system as, as much as it has been corrupted and, and diluted and uh, essentially nullified nowadays, but, uh, Something of it still remains. As we see, the, the, the source of such thinking uh, is in the Torah. Where it is proper and necessary, we are, we are to be uh, ruthless in our pursuit of, of justice and uh, destroying evil and not allowing evil to fester and to propagate in the world. So we shall end here for today. Kol tov lachem, hayu beruchim. Hizku uyames levavchem, kol hamiyahalim adonai. Shalom v'nitzahom. Thank you, Rabbi Bar Chaim. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers. If you identify with Rabbi Bar Chaim's message, and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Israel, or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement.
please email us at office at machonchilo.org.